I'm going to be honest, I, this happened maybe a decade before I thought it would. I, even as someone who's deep in the AI space, I've been for since 2018, um, this change was, it was massive. So I can tell you from my team's side, the world completely changed 60 days ago. ChatGPT has kind of blown the door open on possibilities. My recommendation for brands would be immediately start collecting all of the data you can. Store it, structure it, because I think that is your treasure trove very soon. The models themselves become a commodity. They're free, they're zero, very soon. And the only distinguishing factor is what can you train, what data do you have that you can train it on that no one else can. Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. Today we're doing some deep learning about the future of AI and e-commerce with Josh Wilson, CEO and co-founder of Particle, the platform that uses AI to help brand owners learn what they don't know about their competitors' top-selling products, pricing strategies, and more. If you're launching products in 2023, this one is an absolute must-listen. You'll learn how Particle uses the world's largest e-commerce database to identify trends across over 500 million products and over 80,000 stores daily. So get in the know. You can go to particle.com. We also dive down the rabbit hole of this fast approaching AI takeover of the creative, operational, strategic side of D2C and how it will free up humanity to focus on generating game changing ideas while AI does all the heavy lifting and way sooner than you think. I hope you enjoy this one. On with the show. Josh, welcome to the D2C podcast. Can you start by telling me why you built Particle? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I built Particle. Particle is about two, two and a half years old. Uh, originally, we uh, started the company in COVID. Uh, we were, I was locked at home with my wife after watching Tiger King. Um, started kind of working on, on some of her company's problems at the time. Uh, my wife is actually the COO of an e-commerce company. It's called Five the Label. Uh, they're based out of Bountiful, Utah, and they do dancewear and leotards for for little girls. And essentially, when we were locked home, um, I was trying to figure out um, how to solve their product development problems. You know, it was kind of funny. At, at that size of a company, you know, they could do things to improve their sales by 10%, 20% year over year. But when you're that small, you're really trying to double or triple. So we we're kind of taking home run swings. Um, and if they found a good product that would launch, that would perform well, honestly, they they could double their sales month over month. And so we were, we were aiming for home runs. And so uh, what what I tried to do is basically apply some of the big data principles I've used in other jobs for e-commerce. And we started collecting all of their competitors' information, um, and through uh, essentially through their stock quantities, we could calculate their sales volumes. Um, and so I went to my wife's boss, I took her a spreadsheet and I said, these are the top 10 selling products amongst all your competitors. And two of the ones on the list, she'd been debating creating, but she just didn't feel like that they were going to land. And so once she kind of had some data to back up her thoughts, she launched the two, uh, they're still her second and third best selling items of all time. Um, and, and that was when we started Particle. It was like once we saw the the fruits of you know what just a little bit of information can do. It's it, yeah, and it, it just shows like you know this podcast is largely about marketing, and these are all things that happen way down funnel from product selection quite often. And and the the theme across every you know entrepreneur I interview is that when you have that product market fit, when you have the product right, everything else is a lower lift. Everything else is is a lesser lift. So you start at the source, nail the product that your customers want. And kind of go from there. I, I also just think we talked a little bit in the pre-interview, and I've, <coughs> I think it's super interesting how you actually get this data from these platforms, which is literally you described sort of having a network of, of bots or things that would actually scrape these websites and try to add large amounts of product to a cart one by one, reducing the number. So you actually get a sense of where the inventory is flowing and what's being sold where. Yeah, very much. And, and nothing we do is anything that, you know, a business couldn't do on their own. Um, it's just, you have a lot of problems you're trying to solve. You're trying to land inventory, create top selling ad campaigns, et cetera. So this, we kind of think about it as outsourcing your information team. Um, and, and, uh, you know, we've gotten very good at that. 
Um, that method you described is one of about eight we utilize, um, and, and it's extremely effective. Very interesting. And so what else? Give me, give me some more examples of the kinds of data that you're, you're giving to, to brands to allow them to grow. Yeah. So, so we, we did start with kind of that top selling products, right? Get you, you go to a competitor site or you go to maybe a big brand that you want to be like site and there's thousands of products and there's a lot of noise and you'll see things in the best selling list. And then, you know, from your own experience that sometimes you'll put the extra inventory on best selling because you're trying to get rid of it. So you don't know what you should trust. Um, and, and so that was the original uh, kind of initiation for our company. And where we've really gone since then is all of the decisions that go into a selling selling of a product. So for example, when you run Facebook ads, are those actually converting? Um, and we'll work with entrepreneurs who are trying to understand my competitors do a lot of uh, uh, kind of carousel type ads. Do those work? Do they do videos? Which ones perform? All these types of questions can be answered with data. Uh, which we have and we can assist you with. Um, and then probably the next one, Eric, that's really interesting, is um, pricing is such a big mover of someone going and buying your product. And so you'll see a competitor discount a price or increase a price, and you have no information into what that actually did, the elasticity of a price. Um, and so that's that's kind of one of the new areas we're in, which I'm extremely interested in, is we, you will see a competitor drop by $5 and not in, increase their sales at all. And they just shot their margin in the foot. Uh, likewise, generally, we found you can raise prices and not see any drop off in terms of units sold. And that is a large impact on your bottom line, every, even just a few dollars. So a little bit of data, a little bit of information can make you feel so much better about these decisions. And so often as an entrepreneur, you just don't know what you don't know. You find yourself in these silos where you may be doing well, um, but it's amazing to think, yeah, you could raise your prices by X percent and do that much better. To have it backed by data, by what your competitors are actually doing in the marketplace is a pretty attractive proposition. Um, what are you seeing across the market? Like we're in such an interesting time right now. Um, you know, AI is taking off more and more every day. What like just in terms of, you know, and there's all these, you know, potential real troubles brewing in the economy, in the banking sector. I'm just curious, you know, what are some of the big trends that you're seeing across D to C sales volume and, and pricing, I would say? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, and, and uh, you, you bring up a, a touchy subject for us as we were we were one of the companies with 100 percent of our funds in SVB. So uh, that, that is still top of mind for me. Um, but as, as it relates to, to D2C, we're, we're at definitely an inflection point I've ever seen. So I can tell you from my team's side, the world completely changed 60 days ago. Um, we've, we've always been an AI company, um, and, and I think, Eric, we can get a little bit more into that later. Um, but ChatGPT has kind of blown the door open on possibilities, right? And I can tell you the way we operate – is fundamentally different than it was 60 days ago, right? And I, I think uh, as a tech company, we're kind of the first thing, you know, that we're, we're acutely in that space. Um, but I'm starting to see the ramifications in the D2C world. Um, and, and we can talk about some of those if, if uh, you think it's interesting. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Sorry, the, the ramifications of AI or the ramifications of the troubled economy? Ramifications of AI. Of AI. Yeah. So, so I, I'm just, I, I, you mentioned something earlier about uh, inflation, essentially. We're seeing, uh, you know, cost of goods being inflated across a number of axes. Is that something you're seeing across all D2C products? Yeah, very much. So, so I can tell you that it differs based on category. So, for example, in apparel, we've actually seen a deflationary effect over the last 12 months, which is almost counterintuitive and something we're monitoring. Um, it's likely attributed, so we've seen inventory levels across all brands increase significantly uh, kind of as the fallout of the supply chain crisis. You know, that was like the third world ending crisis ago, right? Like we've had a few since then, but um, as brands piled on all this inventory when you couldn't get any, now they, they're forced to liquidate it, right? And you can see in the public markets is balance sheets are absolutely full of inventory. And I can tell you, we see it on the private side as well. So it's interesting because you have the economy inflating, you have prices going up, but you also have an influx of supply 
and too much supply on your side. And so we're seeing brands try different strategies to try and balance those two things. Um, I can tell you generally, uh, we've seen that a moderate, a modest increase in prices, so let's say 5 to 10%, has not seemed to impact the elasticity at all. Um, I, I believe brands can generally increase 5 to 10% right now, and, and consumers are almost prepped um, for that type of reaction. Um, and then I can tell you that uh, the efficacy of discounts and specifically large discounts seems to work very well right now. So we've seen brands do 30, 40, 50% off items, uh, specifically in like, you know, Lululemon has their we made too much section or whatever, whatever your sales section is. Um, those have proven to be more efficacious recently than historically. And I think there's some reasons for that with consumer psychology. Which is just people looking for a deal, especially, you know, with economic pressures that they may be feeling in other areas of their lives. That means that the deals that where brands go that extra mile and offer that extra bit are really received well. Is that what you'd say? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. And, and I mean, we're, we're just guessing here. Um, but the data seems to indicate that consumers are still spending. They're just seeming to spend on less expensive items. Um and so, so I think, you know, as, as your listeners, your brands contemplate what to do next, um, I think that strategy is working very well right now. Very cool. Um, do you have any other examples? I want to d- dive into AI a little bit more, but I wanted to just get a little bit more out of it because I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's such a simple proposition to be able to understand, um, you know, you, what's selling, what's moving in the marketplace. But can we talk just a little bit more about what that actually looks like? Is there, is there a lot of a, like what, what AI gets in? So specifically in the, you know, in the monitoring of, of uh, supply and, and how goods are being distributed, how does AI play into that product at particle? Yeah, that, it's a great question. So, so what AI is very good at, okay. And if I had to kind of boil it down is it's very good at understanding large amounts of information that the human brain could not um, conceive. Okay. And what, why it's so powerful is up until now, as, uh, as a software engineer, I can create linear connections between things. You know, I can say uh, A plus B equals C, and I can write that in code. What AI is very interesting at is it essentially flips the equation to now where I can say, hey, I just want C, and the computer can go figure out A and B. Okay. And so as that plays to supply chain as your example, okay, you can ask questions like, hey, I want to know, you know, if I should uh, airship instead of freight ship from China because I can get the goods that much sooner and maybe I catch that demand, right? Very complex question. AI is acutely tuned to answer that and answer it well. And um, so I think that's why there is a major fundamental shift happening in the world right now. Um, Because you can answer complex questions that were not possible 60 days ago. Let's dive in on that because we just had GPT-4 come out. Every day there are new, people are finding new incredible ways to use these these tools. Um, First of all, could you start just a little bit of background in in machine learning and like how how you, like how long you've been working in AI, like what brought you into the space? Yeah, very much. Yeah. So I, I did an undergrad in economics. Um, and then I stayed on and I actually did a master's degree in financial economics. And this was back in 2018. And at that time, you know, the, the best models were machine learning models, okay, which, is, uh, which to summarize it, it'd be as if, you know, you have an equation you want to run. Maybe you want to calculate, you know, how much you think a product will sell at a certain price. What machine learning can do is basically replicate that scenario 10 billion times, and give you, okay, given 10 billion iterations, this is the best outcome, right? And so those have performed really, really, really well. Um, the kind of the advancement in AI that has happened is, is these large language models, okay? Which essentially what they are is you can train a general use model. And um, that allows it to make these connections that previously you would have to tell them what those connections were. Uh, and Eric, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. I, this happened maybe a decade before I thought it would, I, even as someone who's deep in the AI space, and I've been for since 2018, um, this change was, it was massive. So what it did is 
um, it started to it started to make relationships that previously were unknown. Okay, and so it honestly is more effective than any software engineer we have than I have um, because it can it can account for use cases that I in a predeterministic way could not have thought of right um, and so it's kind of interesting because it, it happened in the creative space and Eric something you and I talked about beforehand was you know if I had if you had asked me 12 months ago to guess how AI would roll out in the world I would have guessed it would come with very repetitious tasks you know, a robot picks up a box or maybe it fills an order in your warehouse or something of that nature. Um, it's interesting how it's come in the exact opposite fashion. And it started with the creative tasks, right? Started with Dolly, okay? And now it's writing content and copy better than a human can, okay? And I can tell and you- code this, uh, sometimes. Oh, it's, it's writing, uh, Eric, it's probably writing 90% of our code today. It's insane. Um, and, and why I think it's really interesting for your specific brands, okay, and your customer or your uh, your listeners, is people on my end who don't even know how to code, right? So we have a we have a website developer, okay, who mainly uses kind of no code environments. Um, he's been creating a new web page for us that things move on the page, it's dynamic, it it loads, and he doesn't even know how to code. He's just asking it, hey, I want to change this. I want to do this, right? And I think that's really interesting for D2C where, you know, you're not going to spend your hard-earned dollars on a uh, on a software engineer typically. Um, I think, but these types of tools essentially allow you to become a software engineer just by speaking, which is a really, really cool proposition for the world. And I know so many entrepreneurs are plunking in um, their problems, their their con their legal contracts, their uh, you know it's really great for ideating on customer avatars and their pain points and things like this. What are some other ways that you see AI impacting D 2 C entrepreneurs businesses in the next three months or so? Yeah, very much. And and uh, like you said, and Eric, you and I talked about this a little bit beforehand. I definitely think this is like Internet nineteen ninety three. In that, um, really, the large ramifications probably won't be known for five to ten years of what's going on. Um, but the general trend, I can definitely say, is it is it's taking the implementation of ideas um, and making that almost automatic. So, what I think happens is it becomes more about how good of ideas can you have. And less about how much can you make the bring those ideas into reality. So as a D2C person, okay, it becomes less about can I fundraise to hire a software engineer or can I afford to go pay that that person to change my website how I want it to? And it becomes more about, okay, you ideate on what you want to change or what you want to do differently, and the AI brings that to to fruition. Um, and that is a really, really cool world to live in where the only difference between people is how good of ideas you can have. It's amazing. And it's like, you know, you talked earlier about, um, you know, and I felt this as well, like, you know, friends that, that have re repetitive jobs or you see even just in the grocery store with, uh, you know, the cashiers uh, being you know, autom automized or whatever. Uh, and, the, and it, but as a creative person, I'm thinking, okay, well, my my ad writing or my my creative campaign management skills or whatever are always going to be needed. AI comes in and is is removing this. So I think there's a lot of people with with marketers that they'll say things like, okay, well, the best person will become a a cyborg, so the person that's best able to use AI. But I like where you're going with it, where it's just it it really just comes down to the quality of ideas. AI can execute almost from a ver from a verbal cue, spin up a website about this. And it could do it. And, and I was saying earlier, it's it's really an extension of what Shopify is. Shopify did the same thing. All all technology that we're using to build these businesses have all been just to make it easier. Like you talk to someone from the '60s about starting up a business, it it's exponentially easier because of Shopify and all the tools we have. But what you're saying is AI is coming along, and within a pretty short amount of time here, gonna it, it could reduce all the, that other work to zero potentially. I, I think it's and it's happening faster than I ever thought. And so Eric, like, so Facebook released, uh, uh, they released kind of their open source model called Llama, okay. And Stanford took that and trained their own GPT, okay. They spent, a, I think it was under two hundred dollars to do it, and they released a paper on the thirteenth, so less than a week ago, 
and they're getting similar results to GPT-3, okay? And this has happened in like a month. And so uh, it's crazy that, you know, I'm starting to have engineers on my side running this stuff on their own MacBooks, okay? And the concept that this can run on your phone is probably a 2023 thing, right? And so it's interesting that all these large language models are being commoditized almost in no time flat. Um, so yeah, it's, it's happening very, very fast. So, and, and so brands themselves could eventually be spinning up their own AI language models. I remember I was talking with you about the idea I had for D2C of just feeding a, a, a model with all of the conversations I've had on this podcast, all the content we, we produce. And you said, you, were, you sort of said that, that sounds like a pretty, you know, a reasonable thing to do. But he's like, by the time you were to get that done, it would be considered kind of a naive implementation. And I'm just, I, it's hard to wrap your brain around how... You know, like my my mind says, okay, I have something. I put it in the machine. It spits out something uh, interesting or, or useful to me. But it's interesting to think of how much more advanced it will be than that, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. What it, what it probably does for you, Eric, specifically, and I think for your brands, okay, is essentially you feed it all your information, and it actually starts to sound like you, right? And you've seen that in kind of you know you can ask ChatGPT to write you a joke in the tone of Jerry Seinfeld. And it works really well, okay, because it's just trained on that. So for you, I think you start ingesting your own data and it starts personalizing it for you, for a brand, okay? A brand starts ingesting its own information and it starts sounding like your brand, okay? And so a lot of people think AI makes everyone the same. I actually think it enhances our differences in a really, really good way, Um and so with that, my recommendation for brands would be immediately start collecting all of the data you can, okay? Um, store it, structure it, because I think that is your treasure trove very soon, okay? And on the particle side for our business, okay, us collecting the data is the only differentiator between us and anyone else, okay? Because the, the, the models themselves become a commodity. They're free. They're zero very soon. And the only distinguishing factor is what can you train, what data do you have that you can train it on that no one else can. And so for brands, I would be storing every bit of information you can because I think it becomes super valuable to you immediately. And are particle systems set up to help brands uh, like make sense of their internal data as well as the external sort of scraped data that, that you're pulling from out there? Yes. So we, we can be a great partner to get your data system set up. And, and I mean, we've been in this space a lot to know that, you know, brands have a lot going on. Okay. And, and storing data is typically not top on the priority list. Um, so a partner like us, or, I mean, you could do it pretty cost uh, effectively, you know, using a Zapier integration that pipes to Airtable or something of that nature. You, you can do this cheaply. Um, but, but I think that, uh, as you, there's this opportunity cost of not collecting the data. And that's what I really recommend people solve immediately is, is just start collecting it because it's going to be so valuable. And AI just solves that problem of like, you know, you can collect all the data in the world, but if you don't know kind of what you want from it, or if you don't know how to make it tell a story, if you can't make it clean enough to get a signal from the noise, then it just feels like wasted, you know, server space in a way. But that's where AI comes in is it can, it can help, it can solve direct questions that you have. And you can probably even go one layer, layer further, like you're saying, and like, it can tell you what you should want to know from the data, even at times, even if you don't know what you don't want know. Right. And, and so here, here's maybe an example, Eric, we could talk about. So um, one of the most effective Black Friday campaigns we saw was Gymshark. Okay. So Gymshark launched and they did a um, – their Black Friday, their homepage was bright yellow. And it had like 60% off everything in just bold letters. Okay. And that crushed, to be honest. They did really, really well relative to their nearest competitors. Now, that type of branding works for Gymshark. So if I just went to Zara and said, hey, you should do this, that doesn't work for them, right? So why these models are so interesting is it becomes customized for you. And so Eric, it starts recommending the best course of action for you, okay? And it understands that, hey, you can't just make a 180 shift in your brand, right? Like that, just because that's the optimal solution, it, it's customized, um, so yeah. That's super smart. It's like uh, the uh, 
the worry with AI, I remember back in the day, Sam Harris used to talk about how like you tell AI that you want to maximize, you know, screws or something like that. And then it's like, oh, it must kill all humans and turn them into screws. But that's not where we're at. We're at, we're at these models that have this nuance that can understand really what you want, which is why you're not afraid of AI. You're not, you're not, you don't, you don't fear, uh, you, you don't fear that we're summoning the demon with, with AI. It, it just sounds like to you, uh, it's going to free humans up from a lot of the, the toil to really emphasize what's great about our humanity, which is our ideas and our ability to kind of to ideate. It, it is the thing that distinguishes us from any other type of living organism, right? It's it's our key characteristic. And I think AI, AI just enhances that, right? And makes it so anybody can be effective. Anyone can... Um, can do these things. And, and so I think shops, stores end up being able to operate with much less people, much less capital. Okay. Which means you pass those savings inherently off to customers. Okay. And the entire world benefits. And so I, I think that's why it's cool is I think brands will be able to, yes, sell more product, but honestly, almost immediately, they're probably able to do more with less. Okay. Which means they have more flexibility with their margins and so maybe they can use that on marketing. Maybe they can pass those savings on to the consumer, right? And, and time will tell which strategies are the most effective. Um, but you have that flexibility. I think, I think that's what happens is happening right now. Um, and I hope brands are taking advantage. You're mentioning that like this commodification, this idea of the commodification of AI within, within 30 days, they spun up a competitor to GPT-4. Like what, what else is coming down the pipe? Like what does, what's coming down the pipe for AI in the next, like what, what is, what, what's this conversation going to look like in two years, basically, do you think? Yeah. Well, what needs to happen is we need to basically take these models and specialize them for cases. Okay. So the first thing that makes a ton of sense to me in, in the D2C world is customer support. Okay, is a system that, you know, as a user, you don't have to do too much with it, but ingests your order flow, it ingests the emails that you're sending customers, and essentially customer support goes to zero, in that a customer can chat in, they can ask it complex questions, it can answer specific product questions about fit or texture or size, it can recommend, it can check on your order and recommend, tell you, hey, you know, it's FedEx, but it probably is going to get stuck in North Salt Lake for a day. And so you're probably going to get those types of things I think can happen immediately. Um, as, and what we really need is just a, an app spun up. And I'm sure there's 20 being built right now that can ingest a brand's data and basically build you that chat bot automatically. And, and I, I think that happens this year. They, I was just chatting with someone a couple of weeks ago that does exactly this, where they can tell low intent behavior from their machine learning signals. And then anyone who's in this low intent might leave gets a reach out from this like AI tool. So I, yeah, it's, it's definitely already happening. I see this being bit off and, and I can see it being great for customer experience. I think having, having that, you know, having those questions answered can be a huge part of increasing your customer experience. Uh, what what else? What after that? Like where where uh, what what'll be tackled after that? Obviously the ad side of things. Like all the platforms are trying to take control, kind of away from the individual marketers and and allow them to to you know advantage plus for instance. Like all these different systems are trying to automate the whole ad side creation. What else do you see uh, being usurped with AI? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, and, and kind of the first thing we've seen right is it's copywriting. Is people are writing their Google ads using Jasper or ChatGPT or something, right? And um, that, that makes sense as a kind of initial implementation. What I'm what I'm really interested in seeing, and I think it can happen pretty quick, is brands perform differently through different mediums just based on their own characteristics, right? And Eric, I know you know this better than me. Some brands will do really well on TikTok. Other brands have more of an Instagram audience. Other brands, you need to speak to them directly through through email. And so any blog post that's like this one size fits all, here's what you do. Anyone who's been in this world knows it's a little bit naive. Okay. And so what I really hope is that we're able to apply this to your brand specifically. Okay. And we're able to optimize the ways you talk to your customers. That makes sense for you. And it's not some blanket approach. You just throw like a wet blanket, you throw over a fire. Uh, it's, it's customized. And I, and I think that would be really cool because brands I'm working with are trying to figure out, should we try TikTok? Like, it seems like so-and-so is doing it well. Should we invest in there, right? And um, the answer is not the same for everyone. 
Super interesting. What? So we, we, in our audience, like I say, we have, uh, I think it's a lot of brands of traction, all the way up to Fortune 500 mega, mega companies. Um, who, who in our audience do you think gets the most value out of a tool like Particle? It's a great question. Um, so I think the brands who, um, so we typically work with brands doing about 5 million in revenue. Okay. And, t- uh, traditionally what, what we're trying to do with them is we're, we're effectively trying to double their sales. Okay. We're trying to double, triple really large impacts. Now, when I work with a publicly traded company, I'm not trying to triple their sales year over year, right? We're trying to grow by five, 10%, right? And so the, all brands can use information and can use data. Uh, what we really need is brands that are interested in technology and using information, okay? And those brands seem to love us, okay? And we do very, very, very well. So if you're a brand where you are looking for to be different, you're looking for the cutting edge, um, this is the place to come to. Very cool. Nice. Well, if people want to learn more about Particle, they go to Particle with no E, P-I-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com. Uh, and I, I just, we, I know we have so many geeks in this audience. People just love chatting about AI. Are you, are you, are you on Twitter? Are you on LinkedIn if people want to add you? I'm kind of hidden on Twitter. I'll start posting a little more, uh, but, but, uh, and, and we have a Particle account where we will start posting, uh, I think it's Particle HQ on Twitter. Uh, we will start posting daily what's what we're seeing in the data. So inflation numbers, price changes, winning strategies. So so hopefully we can provide you with some content that's useful for you, um, even if you don't work with us directly. I love that, and I think I think there's a great opportunity uh, for to to get some of that information into the newsletter on a regular basis as well. Because I feel like anytime you can provide yeah industry wide information about you know different categories and how they're growing and what's working, like people just eat that up, be super interested in it. Um, I really urge you guys to go check out particle.com, uh, look up Josh on LinkedIn and, uh, we'll have to, I'd like to have you back in the future to, to kind of just keep up on AI. Cause again, you say this stuff is happening faster than we can really understand. It's, it's, that's, what's really neat about, about all this is how fast it's happening. Very much. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you, Eric. Thanks for the time. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumeralloneword.co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.